So, so one of the things that uh, has been under uh, uh, has not been understood well is the difference between primary and secondary brain injury and you'll see why this matters for the 3H bombs and for, uh, for outcomes. Um, we still have no clue how except for prevention. So uh, the, the, way you, the way you deal with primary uh, brain injury is you engineer cars, right, so that the person doesn't hit their head as, as badly. But the primary injury occurs at the instant of impact and there currently is not even a horizon that we know of looking for drugs that could reverse or impact primary brain injury. So that is what it is and has nothing to do with our care uh, uh, in the sense of trying to help it. On the other hand, uh, secondary brain injury, that which occurs after the initial insult, uh, is incredibly important and you'll see has changed dramatically. The understanding has changed dramatically in the last two decades uh, about that. And, and a secondary brain injury universally occurs because at the cellular level uh, there is hypoxia. Uh, and one of the things that you're going to uh, come to understand, which is, which is really a new way of thinking, is that there's two ways to get cellular, hy cellular hypoxia in the brain. One, of course, is if you're hypoxic, uh, in, 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 your, your blood is hypoxic. Um, but the other is anything that creates poor CNS flow. Uh, and so, in other words, it, uh, in other words it, to, to keep to keep the brain cell from dying, you need two things. You need good systemic oxygenation and you need good blood flow. So the neuron is really sensitive to decreases in the cerebral perfusion. Think about this. If their pulse ox shows 100%, but you're delivering only a few red cells to the capillaries near the neuron, it's the same as if their pulse ox were 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 because you're not delivering the oxygen there. So you may feel good about your pulse ox, but if they're not perfusing, it's the same as if they are profoundly hypoxemic. And here's the other thing that you'll see uh, over and over again. The idea that, oh, as long as we get them to the right neurosurgeon, they're gonna fix things is absolutely untrue because it takes about five minutes of brain ischemia to start killing brain cells. So. A, a, an, an essentially new find and new direction in the EMS care for TBI is that what happens in the field is at least, you're going to see the numbers uh, a little later, at least as important as what happens at the trauma center. Uh, it's incredibly important because it happens in minutes. Um, okay, so uh, I've already started uh, uh, honing in on this. Of course we need to prevent and aggressively treat systemic hypoxemia and the things that cause it, but if we don't ignore the perfusion to the brain, a huge issue, then we're actually ignoring the neuron and the outcomes are going to be bad. So it turns out there are three things that we can do in EMS that profoundly impact the neuron, okay? And they are all related to systemic hypoxia, systemic blood pressure, because remember, if this is low, even if this is normal, it's the same as if this is way low. Remember, keep thinking about brain perfusion as the same as profound hypoxemia because that's what the neuron sees. It doesn't see a blood pressure. It sees how many oxygen molecules it gets. That's all it cares about. Uh, and then cerebral vessel vasoconstriction, and as you're going to see, this and this are reversals from, I see some of you are n probably not as old as me, but some of you have been around long enough to, you, you will remember you were told the exact opposite. You were taught the exact opposite on these two issues of how to treat TBI. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much hope that we can actually make a, ma a major difference because we've been doing it wrong, is the bottom line. <clears throat> Here's another key to remember. A person with a trivial, one of your scenarios you're going to see, a person with what ends up being a trivial, only mild primary brain injury loss of consciousness for five minutes, now awake, alert, knows what day it is, can take a test, and they do fine. They're alert now, who then subsequently is mismanaged because they are, for instance, they're bleeding from their spleen and they get hypotensive. You can convert a mild to moderate tra traumatic brain injury into a person who is a 17-year-old who spends the rest of their life in a nursing home. We can create, with secondary, secondary brain injury, we can create severe brain injury when they began with something that might have ended up with a person over the long run has a tiny bit of memory loss for that day and nothing else. Okay, so again, you'll see what we do really, really impacts this. 
So every aspect of pre-hospital TBI is about preventing secondary brain injury. And that's where the three H-bombs uh, are, are all pointed at. Okay, so here's how it starts. You have a primary injury, which nobody has any hint of what we could possibly do about that except prevent it. And then what happens uh, immediately is you start getting an inflammatory process in the brain, okay, and when the, uh, then what you get is you get swelling, you get edema, and something we've focused on in the past is you get increased intracranial pressure. And a lot of our previous treatment was aimed at intracranial pressure, and you'll see why that actually was why we were doing it wrong. Um, the increased intracranial pre pressure can of course come if you get a rapid bleed into the brain. You may not even, you may get marked increased intracranial pressure long before the inflammatory process. So you end up here, this decreases cerebral perfu perfusion pressure. And as you're going to see, good TBI management is almost all about good cerebral perfusion pressure. This is a huge issue to the brain. So when that happens, you get decreased blood flow to the brain, one of the points that we, uh, that we will treat in the three H's. You get decreased oxygenation of the blood. Obviously, you want to uh, optimize oxygenation. You get brain hypoxemia, and then, of course, you get into the vicious cycle of this just gets worse and worse and worse. And remember, when you're looking at this, this is hypoxia from the nerve cells perspective, not just a low pulse ox. This is uh, about brain perfusion as well. Okay, so the goal, this is new, basically. The goal for resuscitating patient TBI is to preserve cerebral perfusion and to deliver oxygen uh, to the brain cells to prevent secondary injury. And the reality is it looks like if we do this, we can move the needle massively in TBI outcomes. Okay, so who should be managed with the TBI treatment protocols? And th this is a real key. The emphasis is basically anyone who could have a brain injury. So, for instance, anyone with loss of consciousness, and you're going to see in one of your scenarios, somebody who now looks great, not that impressive of a mechanism, but, uh, but is a person who did lose consciousness and all of a sudden uh, the person tanks. Um, really, anybody who has the potential to have, have a, a, a brain injury, uh, and certainly that includes people who you're seeing who have a GCS of 12 or less, uh, any the reality of GCS of 14, because they're still out in the weeds, right? They keep asking you what happened, what happened, what happened. This is, that person uh, needs to be assumed to not have a major primary brain injury, but is at high risk for secondary uh, brain injury if we do it wrong. Anyone who requires intubation, even if the reason why they got intubated was because all of a sudden they're, they're, bleeding, uh, they're, they're bleeding into their abdomen and their pressure is 60, and so they're starting to go out, and so you don't think, maybe they were talking to you five minutes ago, you think it's probably not brain injury, but maybe they had brain injury as well, but it's mild. That person who gets intubated because they're dropping out, that person is an incredibly important person, even if their primary, brain, their primary issue is not the brain injury, because we can worsen it so significantly by what we do. Uh, and then anyone, of course, who has a history of after the event having seizures, whether they're still seizing or not, is a person who you should assume needs the, all of the meticulous care of TBI. Okay, so the good news is it really boils down to three H-bombs. Uh, hypoxia, hypotension, and remember, to the brain, this is the same as that. To the brain cell itself, hypotension equals bad hypoxia. And then in intubated patients, hyperventilation. And as some of you already know, 20 years ago, this would have been the PowerPoint slide <laughs> before PowerPoint, uh, where this would have been one of the treatments. And you're going to see the reason why everything has changed uh, really dramatically. Um, and so the H-bombs are critical. Uh, they cost lives and they, and they kill neurons. Okay, so here's the key. The three H-bombs are so significant that if we fail to intervene early, then subsequent definitive care will not recover what was lost in the first few minutes. And this is where I think with your students you want to emphasize, uh, let, let me just get this out fairly early. There was a landmark New England Journal article, so New England Journal by far and away the most prestigious scientific medical journal in the world, where they showed that if neurosurgery occurs in TBI patients who need neurosur emergent neurosurgery, if it occurs in less than four hours versus after four hours, there's a 20% reduction in mortality.
That's a big finding. What you need to understand here is, is that it is possible, as you look at the science now, that if things are done right in the pre-hospital setting, that it is, uh, there could be as much of a reduction as 50 or 60 percent in reduction in mortality and probably a more significant impact on neurologic outcomes even than in mortality if the pre-hospital care is done correctly. This is incredibly important. The bottom line is EMS is as least as important as the neurosurgeon uh, and uh, <laughs> in other settings I, t I just tell them straight to their face, one live brain is worth a room full of neurosurgeons. So the reality is, is what happens in the first few minutes of brain injury care is incredibly important, perhaps dwarfing the impact of the super subspecialist impact on the overall outcome. Okay, so first H-bomb, hypoxia. If you look at the studies, it turns out that patients with severe traumatic brain injury, in some studies between 55 and 70 percent of patients have at least one incident of a, a, a pulse ox of less than 90, okay? Uh, and it occurs in well more of most of the intubation TBI studies, well more than half uh, have at least one hypoxemic event during the intubation. Um, this uh, mor mortality, uh, morbidity increase is, is uh, enormous. So you can see here that the differences in severity adjusted, so these are e equivalent severity in these groups on average. Notice the dramatic uh, uh, increase in severe disability and mortality with hypoxemic events. Um, by the way, uh, it, it may be on another, uh, another slide, but I want to make sure you don't miss this. A single pulse ox of less than 90 in severe TBI independently doubles mortality. One single pulse ox of less than 90 independently doubles mortality. That's how, more, how uh, important this is. Okay, so here's the take home message. And by the way, everybody, you're all, of course, going to have all of the, uh, these PowerPoint presentations. You're going to have all of the backup material. The blue book has this stuff extensively, so you're going to have all of this in your hands. In TBI, preventing and urgently treating hypoxia is a life and death issue. Okay, hypotension. Notice this. A single episode of a systolic pressure, this is in age 10 and greater. We'll talk uh, briefly about peds in a few minutes. Um, in age 10 and greater, a single episode of systolic pressure less than 90 is independently associated with at least a doubling. Now, when you start multiplying these together, you can see the potential impact of EMS care on patients with TBI. It's absolutely profound. And uh, several studies have shown as much as an eight-fold increase if you have multiple episodes of hypotension before the, uh, 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 in the pre-hospital setting for patients with severe TBI. So take home message with the second H-bomb, maintaining blood pressure is absolutely critical to patient outcome in the, in, the, in the deeper dive part of this for you, the master trainers. We'll talk about how this is actually the opposite of what was thought 20 years ago and taught. Okay, finally, in patients who are in, uh, intubated, um, this is profound. Hyperventilation is independently associated with at least a doubling of mortality. And there's one large study from Alabama out of the University of Alabama, which showed one of our colleagues, Kurt Dinninghoff, who was there when he did the study, showed a six-fold increase in mortality if intubated severe TBI patients are hyperventilated versus not being hyperventilated. So who would have thought? And we're going to see, again, uh, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to deal with this issue, but that doesn't make so no sense, though, because it so powerfully decreases intracranial pressure. How could it not be good to hyperventilate, which is what we did uh, historically? Okay, so here's the other thing that, we're going to, that you, you have to, to, uh, uh, to ram home with the, those you're going, to, uh, you're going to teach. It turns out the anesthesiologists and the respiratory therapists are the worst at this. Who would have thought? Um, everyone hyperventilates, everyone who's part of an emergent intubation and then manually ventilates without adjuncts and correction, without, having, without being either technologically or mechanically prevented from hyperventilating, everybody hyperventilates inadvertently. Every last one of us do. And uh, so in other settings, in the hospital setting, what I teach is if you have to manually ventilate, you have no cadence device, you have nothing, no pressure controlled ambu bag, you have none of that, then leave the room in between ventilations. 
And what's amazing is I defy you to not feel like you're, you're killing the patient if you actually sit there and gently squeeze a bag every six seconds. It's just, it, it, it kills all of us. And by the way, as you know, when you just finished an intubation, your epi level is higher than the trauma patient's epi level, right? We all, and then there's this, of course, this whole concept of the, uh, what Dan Davis from University of California, San Diego calls the squeezer, right? I got that tube in, now I'm going to save this guy, right? I'm going to save him. So it's, it's just part of the deal. We've all done it wrong for a really long time. Um, and we're going to talk specifically in the breakout sessions and so forth, we're going to talk specifically about some of the, uh, the very inexpensive to uh, potentially more expensive ways to do that. Uh, here you can see is the modified approach now. If you don't have a cadence device and pressure control, at least uh, a cadence device and a pressure controlled uh, bag, then get, around, uh, get out and walk around the ambulance in between ventilations. You'll get it just about right. So we have been treating, for decades, we had been treating intracranial pressure because we all know it's a brain, the brain's in a box, and the slightest increase in volume in the brain, we know, dramatically increases intracranial pressure, which of course is bad because when you increase intracranial pressure, you can't get blood flow to the brain. We've known that forever, and so that's why we so aggressively intubated and hyperventilated. Well, it turns out, the, 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 uh, the reason why it so dramatically decreases intracranial pressure is because it causes such profound vasoconstriction. So are you ready for this? We feel good about lowering the intracranial pressure, and we did it by killing the brain, okay, by cutting the flow off. And this is so powerful, you need to understand, this is so powerful that if you do in tidal CO2 monitoring, you can find statistically significant increases in mortality just in increments of three. So an entital CO2 of 32 versus an entitled CO2 of just 29, which by the way is one breath per minute difference, you can find statistically increased risk of mortality in that patient who was at 29 instead of at 32. And we'll give you the, the target and the target in a minute. But this is incredibly sensitive, okay? And so by the way, the typical person who does bagging in emergency intubation uh, pre-hospital setting, the typical person bags at 24 to 32 times a minute. Okay, two and a half times. By the way, that typically is an entitled CO2 in the low 20s, which will kill a brain in about six or seven minutes. Okay, so it's literally that sensitive. So here's the, here's the take home message for the third H-bomb. Preventing hyperventilation can make the difference between returning to school and work or spending the rest of a lifetime in a nursing home. We have absolutely no idea how many people have ended up in vegetative neurological states who could have gone back and finished their college degree because we intubated and hyperventilated them, even if we were only doing it inadvertently, even if we weren't trying to. Okay, so in the past, much like the third H-bomb, the second H-bomb, okay, the hypotension, we actually thought for a while, okay, let's get this straight. We've got problems with swelling in the brain so we know we don't want to give them fluids because what if the fluid ends up in the brain, right? So for a long time, the management was, you know, if they're a little hypotensive, maybe it's even good for them. You know, it, it, you won't get as much pressure into the brain because you've kept them. So keeping them dry, which you go back 25 years and that's what they were doing in the ICU with traumatic brain injury patients, guess what? It's the same irony. The reason why you're keeping the ICP slightly lower is at the expense of creating profound shock to the brain. That's why the intracranial pressure. So with both hyperventilation and hypovolemia, what is gained in decreased intracranial pressure is always overwhelmed by what you lost in cerebral perfusion. The reason the pressure dropped was because they had terrible perfusion. Okay, so the trade-off is always in the wrong direction. It made sense. So here it is. Let me just make sure you understand the ironies. Number one, decreasing ICP by keeping them dry does so by decreasing cerebral blood flow. It's how it decreases the intracranial pressure. And irony number two, decreasing intracranial pressure by hyperventilating does so by decreasing cerebral blood flow. And remember, in TBI, it's all about cerebral blood flow. The cell doesn't care whether the intracranial pressure is 30 or 20. All it cares about is if it's being perfused with oxygenated blood. So the net effect is we treat the ICP and kill brain cells. So that's why we're reversing. This is such a key issue in reversing a lot of history. 
Okay, so here is the essence of the guidelines. Really simple. If we do this, we will save probably hundreds, maybe conceivably over the entire five years, thousands of brain injured patients in Arizona. Uh, prevention, and we're going to talk specifically about pre-oxygenation, especially in the scenario number one. Uh, prevention of hypoxia, rapid identification and aggressive treatment. Hypotension, same. Prevention, rapid identification and aggressive treatment. The scenarios are aimed at making sure we understand these and work them out. And then uh, strict avoidance of hyperventilation and rapid correction of hyperventilation and, and, and low uh, in tidal CO2. So that's the essence of the TBI guidelines. The good news is it's not tin long. It doesn't take any new fancy schmancy drugs. It's not expensive. It's much like it's a perfect equivalent to CCR and compression only CPR and hands only CPR and MICR. The, the thing is we simply need to, to adjust what we have already been good at doing and in a couple cases do literally the opposite of what we thought. It's not the ABCs in, in sudden cardiac death in adults, right? It's actually the CABs because they already have oxygen in their blood, so when they drop dead, the key is, is to do compression so you circulate the oxygenated blood that's already in the, lo uh, in the lungs. Who would have thought? It's not the ABCs. Um, very, very similar counterintuitive things here with the H-bombs. Okay, so the foundation of management. How are we gonna take care of these patients? You know, uh, all of us probably know that we all knew this and we often don't do it. Um, so if we actually do this, it's amazing how simple things will actually save a bunch of lives. So, continuous O2 sap, fr very frequent systolic pressures, uh, and uh, if you have uh, the ability to do in tidal CO2 in, in the intubated patient, continuous in tidal CO2. Okay, so, it's all about prevention. Um, so here is a key, um, and this will be emphasized in our conversation with scenario number one when we uh, go into breakout in a few minutes. Um, the, the, everybody who might have had a significant TBI at the moment, meaning they lost consciousness basically, needs to be treated like this. That's right, non-rebreather, big obnoxious bag, as you know, uh, going to waste some money on some oxygen on a lot of patients who don't end up in the long run needing it, but as you'll see, a few patients, it'll save their life. Um, and here's how it goes. If you are hypoxemic, you go to... Uh, BLS airways, if that doesn't correct it, you give positive pressure, but very, very gently at 10 per minute. We'll talk about some of those adjuncts uh, in the breakout. Um, does that correct it? Um, if that does not correct it, then if you have an ex uh, advanced, uh, an experienced intubator there, then you go to an, advanced, uh, uh, to an ALS airway. Um, in any other case, obviously, you just simply go into, you, fine, you corrected it, uh, and you stay at that level. Okay, so uh, what about advanced airway? Uh, EPIC is not, because nobody knows for sure, uh, frankly, the literature now is all over everywhere, all the way from some people saying we shouldn't intubate TBI patients anymore because it's associated with such terrible outcomes. Well, what we have contended in our NIH application and in a paper that will be published in Annals in a few months is that what the problem is, is intubation has historically been really a tracer for hyperventilation, because everybody who doesn't prevent it always does it. And there's now a randomized study that's come out of, of uh, Australia um, that has shown that if you meticulously take care of hyperventilation, if you ventilate correctly after doing intubation and TBI, the best outcomes and the best neurologic outcomes were in the patients who were intubated and properly ventilated. The problem is, is if we don't force the proper ventilation, we always lose more with intubation than we will ever gain. So the reality is, is this EPIC is not about saying there's a new group of people you ought to uh, intubate or you shouldn't be intubating people. It is continuing to care for the patients when it comes to airway as you think about it. However, focus on multiple issues. Remember, pre-oxygenate everybody because you don't know who's going to tank. If you start pre, well, if you start oxygenating with high flow O2 when the patient already tanks and now you have to intubate them, the percentage of those patients that get hypoxemic are very high. We'll talk about some of the amazing animal physiology of that in, our, in some of our uh, later slides. Um, okay, so this is really effective at, preve at preventing hypoxemia. Again, we'll talk to it. Uh, and then be uh, diligent uh, uh, to, to avoid hyperventilation and hypotension uh, uh, as well. 
Okay, so one of the things that's important for us to understand is uh, all of these drugs that we use typically, uh, is, anybody using, uh, is anybody using Atomidate? Okay, some, well, we were when we could get it. Um, okay, Atomidate is much better, but, the, but many, many EMS systems around the country and around the state of Arizona are using these drugs in the patients who we're going to or have intubated with TBI, right? Here's the problem. Every one of these are powerful venodilators. So if the person's pressure is 100 and you give them a little bit of this because we're worried that it's going to bother, you know, it's going to bother them, they need sedation. If that drops from 100 to 85 one time, we've already doubled the likelihood that they will have a, a they will die from a TBI. So great caution. Again, we're not changing anybody's protocols, but just remember great caution out there. So for instance, if you're used to giving a certain amount of morphine, start way low so that you don't get the dip. This is classic for creating the reason why they had good blood pressure was because all the arteries and the veins are squeezed, right? And they're in compensated shock, so they're not hypotensive. And then you give that morphine and it goes like this and they drop out. That one drop kills patients. Take great care with this. Okay, if using manual ventilation, I don't, uh, I don't know how else we could make more emphasis on this. Let's say when you go and start teaching this now and you don't, haven't gotten your cadence devices yet, uh, then somebody ought to be the spotter. There ought to be somebody there that has the old teacher's uh, you know, thing with the ball on the end so you can smack them up the side of the head. Um, as soon as they go to 15 per minute, Somebody needs to be saying that, nope, 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 this is every six seconds, and saying, wait a second, we don't save them by squeezing. We save them by being really, really gentle. That's how we save them. So uh, you need a spotter. You may want to keep a spotter for this, even if you have enough resources in your system, even if you have all the widgets. You may want to have somebody, who's, somebody watching the person who's supposed to be watching um, uh, for this. Um, and then, of course, in tidal CO2, uh, and this is really, really important. Who would have thought the target is not hyperventilation? Take this slide 20 years back, and it this would have said the target's about 25 to 30. You know, we were doing QI projects to make sure we killed them. Um, so the target is actually 40, normal. Who, again, this is like so counterintuitive to the old dogs, right, because we thought, Surely we gotta hyperventilate them to get that ICP down. So here's the range, and the target is actually completely normal in tidal CO2. Okay, um, this of course has potentially big uh, resource issues in your community, but let me tell you that as far as it goes for TBI, if the pancake breakfast isn't committed, uh, commit it to ventilators. This is probably true, by the way, by ev in everyone who's critically ill and intubated, not just TBI not just post-cardiac arrest, but certainly those two for sure. Uh, uh, ventilating is by far and away the most optimal. And by the way, it's important to realize for all of those that learn the 10 to 12 per kilo, we're actually injuring the lung and setting people up for ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and again, this is, I'm emphasizing some of this more because you're master trainers than you will spend probably with your providers. But if you have a ventilator, Seven, no more than seven cc's uh, per kilo is really important for, for uh, setting it at. Um, if you're not using a ventilator, then you should be using a pressure control uh, ambu bag um, and a cadence device. And by the way, one of the things that's really important, a lot of the air medical provi providers in the room, this will actually be true of the ground uh, uh, transport folk as well. If you spend eight minutes from the time you intubate a TBI patient, until they finally make it into the aircraft or into the rescue vehicle, and then you put them on a ventilator. If you did the typical hyperventilation that all of us do in that eight minutes, you probably will have significantly made the patient's outcome poorer. This has to be from the first breath. For instance, how many of us, I mean, how many times in my career have I said, oh good, the tube's in, bag them up? That concept of bag them up has to go away unless the person is hypoxemic. If the person's not hypoxemic, the first two breaths should be six seconds apart. Okay, so that's how powerfully bad hyperventilation is. So even if you have a ventilator, it's useful to have these other adjuncts. Okay, hypotension. 
maintain at 90 or above, and B, the, again, this is for the, for the people who've been around a long time, you're going to say, really, we're going to run, we're going to like run in a leader into a bad brain injured patient? Absolutely. Because the worst thing for a brain injured patient is shock. So we aggressively treat shock, start with 1,000, and then don't be ginger. You just keep going to keep it above 90. In our, in our more detailed Q&A time for the master trainer folk, we can talk about the issue of permissive hypotension and so forth, but don't clutter that up for now unless somebody asks you a question. The answer is no, don't let them stay hypotensive. You've got to get rid of hypotension as quickly as it occurs, and you've got to do so aggressively. <clears throat> Okay, Epic for Kids, just a couple of things. Uh, same basic issues. By the way, most of you know that almost everyone who's less than a teenager, it's a, well, th you probably know, a whole bunch of people now, a whole bunch of kids now are having entire general anesthetic surgeries at the hospitals all over America, and they've never been intubated. They're literally bagging the kids or using LMAs without the intubation. The reality is, is most kids, the BLS airway is very good uh, at, and it then potentially creates uh, a, a much better outcome because none of us intubate lots of kids except in a very focused uh, area. Okay, so remember, use a spotter. This is uh, true of all ages. Same approach, and by the way, there are commercially available PEDS pressure uh, bags as well. Same target. And uh, this is worth knowing. Okay, so initial rates, adults are 10, okay? And uh, for the purpose of this, it's older adolescents and adults. Children, so basically the teen and preteen group uh, are 20 per minute, breast per minute. And then infants, so basically if they're age zero or age one, but not yet age two, 25 breaths per minute. Now, by the way, remember, when they look at people who aren't thinking about it and they've intubated adults and they're, uh, they're ventilating, the typical ventilation is between 24 and 32. Think of that. Most of us are already bagging faster than neonates ought to be bagged. So this is one of the reasons why it's gonna, you're, we're going to feel like we're killing people when we ventilate them at the right rate. So there are the rates. And again, you'll have, you have all this material. And this material actually even should be on your pocket cards uh, that you've gotten. Okay, so how about hypotension in kids? Some of you may remember the rule of thumb, uh, excuse me, may, may remember the, the formula, but for me, I just keep these three numbers in my mind. You don't want, anybody, you don't want any kid at any age, we're, for, we're not talking about preemies uh, here typically, of course. It, it, nobody at any age do you want a systolic less than 70, okay, and a five-year-old is 80, and once you get to double figures, everybody should stay up at 90 or above, okay? so. Infants, 70, five-year-olds, 80, and 10-year-olds and older, 90. Okay, hypotension in kids. This is something that probably all of you know. We're treating it the same way. We've got to get rid of hypotension, and we do so by boluses of 20 cc's per kilo. Uh, most of you probably have the length-based uh, um, uh, weight uh, thing, so you quickly do that. Get the length, how many kilos, uh, 20 cc's per kilo. And you continue to do that every five minutes until the child is no longer hypotensive. Don't hesitate to continue aggressive resuscitation. Uh, intraosseous in kids, you follow your local protocols. Just a reemphasis of this, because it's really bad for a kid to be hypotensive, uh, most kids that are uh, hypotensive and brain injured are going to be, uh, are gonna, you're going to be able to do ION mental status wise. So if they have hypotension or other signs of shock, don't wait for them to get hypotensive. If also you have difficulty getting peripheral IV access, and if their mental status is such that they'll allow you to do the procedure without hurting them, you probably should do IO. Again, those are, uh, there's some variation in local protocols. OK, the big question always, even though, as you know, if you've done this a long, long time, there's still have been only a small subset of your TBI patients who are showing you an impending herniation. It's still worth knowing. Uh, about. So here's a classic epidural hematoma. Okay, so it's a person who may not have had a bad primary brain injury, but now they've got this huge hematoma rapidly growing, and it's starting. Here's the tentorium on each side here, and here's what's called the uncus is being pushed down through here, and of course is pressing on the brain stem. This is a bad thing. Um, and uh, so, how do you pick up on impending herniation? 
uh, it, because it's a clinical diagnosis, obviously there's variation, but here's the focus. Um, either bilaterally blown pupils or asymmetric pupils with at least one of them not being uh, uh, reactive. By the way, anisocoria, a significantly different pupil of one versus the other, one in 10 people actually have anisocoria. So it's not two different but reactive pupils, it's at least one of the pupils is reactive and significantly different. Okay, a GCS of la uh, less than nine and going in the tank. Classic for herniation is they start extensor posturing, a two, right, a two on the motor part of the GCS. Um, and uh, notice, a GCS by itself, just because they're comatose, doesn't mean they're herniating, right? In fact, you will take care of, if you get there fast, you'll take care of some people completely comatose who 10 minutes later completely wake up, right, before you even get to the hospital. So it's not the GCS by itself, it's all of those things put together in combination. Okay, and if that happens, then here's why, this is ironic, isn't it? Administer, if you see impending herniation, you should hyperventilate them <laughs> at a rate that's slower than we're doing today, right? Everybody is seeing the irony here? Okay, so yes, hyperventilation is mild to moderate, and the reason why is you're only headed for an entitled CO2 of 28 to 31. And if we hyperventilate at 24 to 32 like we usually do, we're usually in the low 20s. And it doesn't matter what anybody else does, if you have a person in the low 20s for five to eight minutes, they, their brain cells are gonna die. Okay, so avoid in tidal CO2 of less than 28, and this is only in acutely herniating people. <clears throat> okay, so the hyperventilation in kids, um, uh, remember, uh, Adolescents, late adolescents are just like adults. This is hyperventilation rate in kids. Uh, in children, instead of 20, you go to 25. And in infants, instead of 25, you go to 30. In tidal CO2, same in the kids. Okay, you have, all of you should have gotten a really nice uh, copy of the Blue Book, right? That's got uh, hundreds of references, more than you want to know. Uh, about TBI. It also, by the way, has all of the algorithms for both adults and kids. It has all of the detailed protocols for adults and kids. Uh, and this will be something that you'll want to get into the hands of everybody.